All right, so we are going to get things started now with our universal basic income debate. Uh, should America have a universal basic income? The session is moderated by myself, David Clement, and our participants are Jeff Myron and Andrew Yang. Jeff Myron is a economics professor at Harvard, and Andrew Yang is a Democratic candidate for president in 2020. So please welcome uh, our two speakers, Andrew Yang and Jeff Myron. So universal basic income is an interesting topic. It's an interesting topic for classical liberals, libertarians. There's a, there are those who argue in favor. There are those who argue against. It's something that could be a bridge between liberals slash progressives and those uh, libertarians who obviously argue in favor. But I think what most often happens when we talk about this issue is it really comes down to the details, the devil is in the details. And that's kind of the purpose of this conversation um, between these two uh, renowned uh, thinkers and, and, and activists. And so how we'll structure this is we'll, we'll give each uh, participant five minutes to, to essentially just outline their stance. And then it will be a free-flowing conversation between the two um, with myself, making sure that questions get answered and nobody's talking past each other. Um, so we will start, um, we'll start with Andrew in terms of explaining your stance here, the freedom dividend, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you your five minutes now. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Yang. I'm running for president in 2020. And I'm running, I'm a serial entrepreneur, started uh, several businesses and companies. I, I was the CEO of an organization called Venture for America that helped create several thousand jobs in the Midwest and the South. And while I was doing that, I realized that our, our economy is transforming irrevocably because of technology. And I'm going to submit to you all that the biggest enemy of human freedom, your freedom, is that your labor, your time, is being valued less and less by our economy. You're getting trapped in a subsistence labor arrangement that is getting darker and darker. And that's what's happening around the country. We eliminated four million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa over the last 15 years. And we're about to do the same thing to millions of retail jobs, call center jobs, fast food jobs, truck driving jobs, and that's going to be a singular disaster. I mean, there are three and a half million truckers in this country. It's the most common job in 29 states, 94% male, uh, average education high school, making $46,000 a year. So what is their next economic alternative going to be when their jobs start getting usurped by self-driving trucks. I'm going to say that they're not going to feel very free at that time. You could say, hey, you're free to do whatever you want, but these are people who invested tens of thousands of dollars of their life savings in a truck that can no longer compete against a truck that drives 24 seven. So I'm running for president on the idea that we, the American people, this country is now wealthy enough where we can afford a dividend for all of us, the owners and shareholders of this great country of $1,000 a month. Free and clear, no questions asked, to do whatever you'd like. And that is my mission as president is going to be to help our economy evolve in advance to make us more free, but also to help our country manage the transition because we are in the midst of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of the world. And we need our politicians to wake up to this reality before it is too late. Thank you. How long was that? That was approximately three minutes. See, I, you know, I even get it done faster. <laughs> <laughs> efficiency, efficiency. Uh, Jeff, you, would you mind explaining your, uh, your stance? So I'd like to start with just three points. So first, I am personally opposed to any federal redistribution that covers welfare, food stamps, covers Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and on and on and on and on and on. So I don't think the federal government should be in the business of taking from some and giving to the others on whatever basis. Okay? And so, of course, I'm not going to be enthusiastic about a universal basic income because that is taking from some and giving to others in this particular way. Second, of course, my view is unusual. It's not the uh, most widely held view. 
And lots of people do think the federal government should be engaging in this redistribution. But we can't afford the current entitlement welfare spending that we have, adding together all the programs that I mentioned and lots of miscellaneous others. If we can't afford, okay, going forward, taking into account the changing demographics and the increase in the cost of health care that are almost certain to occur, if we can't afford all of that, we certainly can't afford to add okay, a substantial amount more of entitlement spending. The proposal that Andrew has on his website is for $12,000 per year, okay, basic grant, okay, basic income, for every person age 18 and over. If you do the arithmetic, that comes out to an additional $3 trillion a year, an economy that's up just under about $20 trillion right now. Now, Andrew does propose to pay for some of that with reductions in the existing welfare spending, but only a relatively modest portion. Even if you cut all of it, if you did what liberta some libertarians would like, eliminate all of the federal programs, that's only $2.4 trillion. So you're still in something of a hole. Third point, okay, if we would, were going to enter into a grand bargain where we adopted a universal basic income, like the one Andrew proposes, and eliminated all the existing programs that I mentioned. So there's no Medicare, Social Security, on and on. We even go farther. We eliminate other federal policies that are aimed at redistributing, but that are laws, regulations, and so on, like the federal minimum wage, uh, federal support for unions, and so on and so forth. If we could actually agree on that grand bargain, and we had some way of convincing ourselves we would stick with it, we would be committed to it, would a universal basic income be a far better way to redistribute that amount of income than the current method. On that point, absolutely, I would completely agree with advocates if we actually believe we would stick with that grand bargain. I think to state that grand bargain is to basically prove it's incredibly unlikely, but there are certainly benefits of simply transferring cash as opposed to the incredible mess, the incredible hodgepodge of redistribution programs we have now. Thank you. So I think what Jeff's done is, is We'll start off with, yeah. his, with his second point, um, which is obviously a pressing question given the financial circumstances of the United States. What are some of the responses in terms of generating the revenue to pay for it? We can certainly go on to its efficacy yep. and, and the grand bargain question, because I think that's a, a valuable discussion. But let's get into some of the, the numbers in terms of how, how this is paid for in your view. Yeah, so what's funny is when my team was uh, preparing me for today, they had footage of Jeff saying something along the third point, um, which is that, uh, you know, this would be a vast improvement over 126 welfare programs and current arrangements. And I was like, this is not going to be much of a debate. <laughs> I feel like we actually <laughs> agree um, uh, on a whole lot of things. Um, and Jeff also suggested that I was somehow entering into, like, a, you know, an environment where people would be negatively predisposed towards universal basic income. And I was like, that hasn't been my experience at all. Like, most of the libertarians I know are very much for this in part because I know Milton Friedman championed this um, as something that would be a vast improvement over the current situation. So I'm an operator, I'm an entrepreneur, like I understand dollars and cents. I've sold a private company for millions of dollars to a public company, like I get it. I actually, I, I, I joke with people, the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I understand the math um, and, and and we have to look at the world as it is. Like, if you look at it and say, and then what it can be. So, uh, almost two thirds of the federal budget, entitlement programs, you know, we're talking about like, you know, a trillion and a half, like not including uh, healthcare, and then you include healthcare, it's like, it's vast. It is going to wreck us, it is going to destroy us, it is already destroying us. And it's pushing us into this, um, like this terrible circumstance where the federal government literally has their hands tied with like over two thirds of the budget. It's bananas, like we're fighting over this marginal stuff while like our economy is getting swallowed up uh, by, by the entitlement universe. So that's the situation we're in. Now, I've run a business, um, and so I was joking backstage where like if you take something away from people, they tend to freak out. Like where I was joking with uh, about like Netflix, where it's like even Netflix like changes their price by two dollars, we like freak out. <laughs> um, and so what I'm suggesting is we need to create a dividend for all Americans, and then say, hey, if you're getting welfare, um, you're on disability, you have a choice between the freedom dividend and your current benefits. 
And if you prefer the freedom dividend, $1,000 straight cash, no questions asked, then you lose your current benefits. You have to give people a superior alternative. That's the way you win in the marketplace generally. And we have this reality where, again, we're spending hundreds and hundreds of billions on these entitlement programs. So we have to beat them. And the way to beat them is to say, here's a dividend, no questions asked. And what you would see is you would see that the vast majority of people who are trapped in these 126 welfare programs would vastly prefer $1,000 cash. You would end up lightening the bureaucracy very, very quickly and making it so that what's presently like a dehumanizing paternalistic system gets replaced by cash. But the only way to do that in real, in real life um, is to say, look, we're not going to touch the, the programs because we know many of you are relying on them, but we're gonna provide you a superior alternative. So the question on the math, that's one reason why this is so much more affordable, and Jeff, I know, has gone through the numbers too. If you were to say $3 trillion, an economy of 20 trillion, probably can't afford that. But then when you break it down, you're like, well, we're already spending a trillion and a half on cash assistance and, uh, and income assistance to Americans. It's gonna reduce that price tag very, very fast. But the way you pay for this big picture is we have to recognize that it's 2019 and that uh, Alaska has paid for a dividend for the last 37 years with oil. And I'm gonna ask you all this question, what is the oil of the 21st century? Someone, someone said marijuana. <laughs> if only marijuana were enough. I'm, I'm for the legalization of marijuana too, uh, just so you know. But I'm going to submit to you all that technology is the oil of the 21st century. Artificial intelligence, big data, self-driving cars and trucks, robotics, all of this stuff is going to throw off untold value, unfathomable value, even as it's kicking more and more Americans uh, to the curb in terms of their work. And the trap we're in right now is that the big winners from all these new technologies will not be paying a whole lot of taxes. Like, who are the big winners? Amazon, Google, Facebook, Uber. They don't pay a lot of taxes. Amazon's just gonna say, we didn't make any money this quarter, no taxes necessary. Google will say it all went through Ireland, nothing to see here in the States. And so we're gonna be trapped in this, this cycle of scarcity where we're gonna be looking around being like, where's the money? Um, while all the value is gonna get soaked up. So what we need to do is we need to harness the value from all these new technologies and use that to pay for the dividend. Can you specify that harnessing the value is taxation? Is that, is that an appropriate understanding? Yes, okay. but I think you guys are gonna like this, is that income taxes are a terrible way to try and make this uh, happen because people are just great at moving that, this thing around. You might not like this next part. So, um, <laughs> so, so, the, so I looked into how can we get the value from all these tech companies and the best way to do so that I've found is what every other advanced economy has already done, which is to adopt a value-added tax. So we start moving away from income taxes, which are not gonna get the gains from all of this AI and new technologies. We move towards a value-added tax, which will, and because we're gonna experience this massive growth, our economy has grown by $5 trillion in the last 12 years. Like, it's growing, we just haven't seen the growth in terms of our own resources. So if you put in a value-added tax at even half the European level, you get, almost a trillion dollars in revenue, which is enough to pay for a freedom dividend for all of us, and then that money does not disappear. We spend it in Main Street businesses, they hire, we create more touch points, more jobs, more freedom, create hundreds of thousands of new entrepreneurs, that's where the dividend will go. But we're, none of this is going to happen if we start fighting over like uh, a, a shrinking pie because of our current welfare system and our limited uh, tax revenue. So we'll get into, into the efficacy of, of a possible value-added tax and, and break down some of the numbers. But for you, Jeff, you, your third point was a grand bargain. And correct me if I'm wrong, what you've presented here seems more like a moderate bargain in terms of offering people the option of your current benefits or making the change. I think it's a grand-er bargain. <laughs> okay. Well, um, the, because instead of going to people and being like, hey, we're going to slice the pie up differently, sure. we're going to be like, hey, here's the pie. You can think what you want about it. I'm going to like provide you a freaking cake, <laughs> you okay. know, and then the cake shrinks the pie and then we're all in much better shape. So I know that you have some concerns with, with that, that offer. Do you mind explaining your response to the, the circumstances that will arise if, if Americans are presented your current benefits versus this freedom dividend. 
Well, I think it crucially is going to depend on what that choice is. If, for sure, I completely agree with Andrew. Andrew, many people will prefer the flexibility of a cash grant over the equivalent amount of uh, payments in kind, mm -hmm. or coming with restrictions and things like that. I completely agree with Andrew that the concern that people just getting cash grants outright will spend it all on alcohol, gambling, and the like. Of course, a few will because people at every level, some of them make bad decisions with their expenditure, but I don't have that particular concern at all. Sure. But I still just unfortunately have to focus on the wonky point that I don't think the arithmetic adds up. Yep. Let me talk about that a little bit. How much can a basically capitalist economy they spend? Okay, overall, federal, state, local. Okay. If we look at Europe and the United States, other rich countries, okay, you can actually spend, seem to be able to spend in a sustained period more than the U.S. is spending. I will grant that. You look at the growth rates of real output mm -hmm. in many European countries, they're very similar overall. I don't mean just the last two or three years, but over long periods to the U.S., despite the fact that some of them have more like 40, 45 percent uh, government spending over GDP, whereas the U.S. is about 35%. So I don't want to say we can't afford to spend anymore, but what you clearly cannot do, anyone can do who believes the laws of arithmetic, independent of any of your values or your politics, is have expenditure that's growing okay, every year on average faster than GDP can plausibly grow. And the forecast for Medicare, Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare in particular for the U.S., are that that set of programs is going to grow 1% to 2% faster than the historical average of GDP. Mm -hmm. Now, Andrew seems to be appealing to the idea that we're in a new era where, because of improvements in technology, we're going to have the economy grow much faster, or noticeably faster than in the past. If that happens, of course, it gives you more options. But we've had new technologies coming along for decades, centuries, even in some sense, you know, millennia, all the evidence would suggest that's going to continue at more or less the past rate. At a minimum, it's heroic to assume that this technology is going to improve so much faster than in the past that we're going to have so much more output that we can then make these additional expenditure commitments. So I think the math, it doesn't even come close given that we have these programs that are going to grow much faster than any plausible forecast. In addition, should note that Andrew's proposal in particular has us giving 12,000 a year to everyone who's 18 and over. Mm -hmm. The fraction of the population 18 and over is going to keep growing, okay? Assuming life expectancy increases, that healthcare uh, continues to get better. So that means even the expenditure on this particular program is likely to go up relative to GDP, okay? It's not gonna be nearly as bad as Medicare because it doesn't have the health cost inflation component, but it still is something you have to worry about the growth, not just the level. Um, I could not agree more that healthcare is something that is breaking the back of our economy um, and families and businesses. I've been a CEO and business person, and our healthcare system is the worst of all worlds, where it's a disincentive to hire. It's a disincentive to make someone a full-time employee. It's one reason why the vast majority of new jobs in our economy have been gig temporary contractor jobs, because as an employer, you don't want to pay for someone's healthcare. Um, and so we need to start rationalizing our costs there. I couldn't agree more that uh, the, uh, the U.S. has a cost problem in terms of like the inefficiency that's baked in. In part, I have a friend who's a private investor in healthcare companies, and she tells me that she has never seen this level of uh, profiteering and like corruption in terms of billables in the healthcare industry. And she says she's even started shorting these companies because she says this is unsustainable, this cannot go on. The problem right now is that the American people are on the hook for that. So, so we have to clean that up. Um, but I'm going to su submit to you all that, uh, that these things are not necessarily in opposition. It's like, we can't say it's like, look, we can't give us, ourselves, the owners and shareholders of this country, money that we know, like, it's not like, that, again, that money doesn't disappear. That money is like in its optimal hands. It's in our hands and we'll be able to do exactly what we want with it. That's the ideal. That's the ideal for any company that you have a dividend and the, the wealth flows to shareholders. So I 100% agree with Jeff that we need to clean up our broken uh, healthcare and entitlements system. On the math side, the math does work out. Like, so to use Jeff's estimate, which, which is my estimate too, let's say roughly $3 trillion. Now, right now we're spending about $900 billion in Social Security, like $600 billion, 126 welfare programs, 
Um, let's say you take some proportion of that and it ends up reducing your three trillion to something like uh, 1.8 or something along those lines. Um, now you have this value added tax that, I, uh, that I'm recommending um, that would raise like between 800 billion and a trillion. So you're left with maybe like 800 billion or so left over. Now here's the magic. If you all have that money, you spend it in the consumer economy, it ends up growing the consumer economy by like eight to 10%. You create a couple million new jobs around the country, and then we get back a significant proportion of that in new revenue, because that we just grew the economy, and so we get back about a third of that in new revenue. So that's going to generate hundreds of billions, and then we, spend, we save hundreds of billions on healthcare and emergency room, incarceration, homelessness services. I was just in New Hampshire and a prison guard, a prison guard said to me that we should just pay people to stay out of jail because he sees how much waste happens when they hit our system. That's a freaking prison guard. Um, and so it, like, we end up paying for all of this stuff anyway, but we pay for it in much more expensive, dark, institutionalized fashion. Whereas if we put the money into people's hands, it's then going to help keep them more functional and we all win. And then the last piece of the value gains is we'd be making our own population, us, stronger, healthier, better educated, mentally healthier, more productive, which even if you're conservative would end up generating hundreds of billions in value. So this thing is much more affordable than most people believe because most people don't take into account all of the second order benefits that would result from us having an additional thousand dollars a month. So I think we've identified some areas where you both agree on, in principle, we've identified some areas where you disagree. I think the next conversation here in terms of how this is paid for is something along a value added tax. Because from my understanding or from how I'm understanding how you've described it, that seems to be the, the hinge point in terms of tech being something that the American government can generate revenue from at an exponentially larger rate over time in the same way that, that governments have with oil. Yes, so just as one example, the reason why my friends in Silicon Valley are gunning for automating truck driving uh, so diligently is that the cost savings are estimated to be $168 billion per year annually from automating away truck drivers. And that's not just labor savings, that's uh, fuel efficiency because you can convoy them and there's less wind yeah. resistance, yeah. equipment utilization because the truck never stops, fewer accidents because 4,000 Americans die in accidents with truckers every year. And that's just one example of the value gains from technology. $168 billion a year, I mean, that's like sure. a significant component. So if you take that, then you also take artificial intelligence replacing two and a half million yeah. call center workers, which will so happen. We can, we can build on that assumption. This is where I want to go to Jeff. What are the consequences of a value added tax? Do they generate the revenue in which they actually forecast? What are the unforeseen externalities? So you've outlined possibly some fairly positive externalities. What are there negative ones to a value-added tax at this rate? Is it, is it even possible to generate revenue in that matter without having firms shift where they do business, except like all the other things that we see, whether they go to Mexico or, or what have you? So again, it's important to talk about the amount versus the structure. As sure. a kind of tax, as a structure of a tax, lots of economists, including lots of free market-leaning economists in particular, they are very sympathetic to having a value-added tax, mm -hmm. especially if it were the only value-added, only form of taxation, of and especially if it were done in certain sort of details, and wonk, wonky aspects mm -hmm. were handled in the right way. Of course, it's not a panacea. It's still a tax. There's still plenty of incentives to evade and avoid it, and there are all sorts of ways that businesses can do things with their invoicing and to minimize. So any estimate of how much revenue you would get is probably going to be optimistic, if you take 10% and multiply it by the relevant you know, amount, the actual amount is probably going to be less. But it also is a tax. It's taking money away from some people and giving it to others. It's going to have negative disincentive effects. So we shouldn't think that it's somehow just sort of free to say other countries have a value-added tax, so we should have one too. It is going to increase the burden of taxation on American consumers. Okay, and I think politically that's going to be extremely difficult, but it also has efficiency effects for the economy. Economists say it is lower efficiency effects than income taxes overall, but it doesn't mean it has no efficiency effects. It mm -hmm. really does have those. Yeah. Um, Keep going. So I guess I still want to have to go back to the math. So 
what um, Andrew outlined, I also did my homework and <laughs> looked him up, he has the current spending that he thinks would be offset by this UBI of 506 billion, that's part. He's getting about a trillion from the value added tax. My guess is that's optimistic. Um, but he also is getting a significant amount from his optimism about the enhanced growth. I don't quite see how we're gonna get the enhanced growth out of switching a relatively modest amount of welfare spending uh, onto the UBI. And I, then I, the I, I'd just like to ask the crowd, like how many of you think that you might be more likely to start a business if you were receiving $1,000 a month? So we have some hands. Yeah. Instead like, of or in addition to? Well, right now, most of the people here are now receiving food stamps and whatnot, I'm guessing. So, uh, so if, if you were to look around this room and you have even a handful of hands going up, that's your efficiency gain. Is this that efficiency <laughs> gain? So here's the question, is it, does that efficiency gain actually cover the gap in funding? Is there, is there research or? It doesn't cover it entirely, but it covers a proportion of it. And so I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs. I've created thousands of jobs around the country. And entrepreneurs tend to have a mindset of abundance, optimism, possibility, where if you do something, you think you can get ahead. Uh, and that's what you would end up creating in millions of Americans around the country if you were getting $1,000 a month because you know your basic needs are met, you know you're not gonna die, like you know everyone else has more money to spend. And so then, like the example I use is if you have a town in Missouri with 50,000 adults um, and then you have $1,000 a month more into their hands, that's another $50 million a month getting spent in or around that town and then any business you start becomes a better idea like a bakery, like let's say I, I want to start a bakery and it's a terrible idea now, but then like post Freedom Dividend, it's a good idea. I can get more people to help me out and work with me because everyone has a better sense of uh, the possibility. And if the bakery fails, I know I'm not going to starve to death. Like everything ends up being much, much more uh, of a mindset of abundance if we have a Freedom Dividend. So I feel, Jeff, I feel like you're itching to How respond here. How many people would be more likely to start a small business if you were not faced with capital gains taxes on the appreciation of your capital. Okay, you get my point. <laughs> Many so hands. We have to think both about the fact that if you give people money, they could use a seed money to start a business. Of course, that might affect some people, but it didn't come from as mana from heaven. It came by taxing other people who are gonna be discouraged from starting businesses because their taxes have to be higher to pay for okay, the universal basic income. So I think once you take that into account, the efficiency gain is minor. I'm willing to concede that certainly in terms of people's well-being, giving them flexibility to spend money as they want may make them better off, and that plausibly could translate in smallish ways to some efficiency you could see in GDP data, but I think that's likely to be very, very small, not the magnitude that you generate the numbers you need to make this be roughly budget neutral. I have to say, I think Jeff and I really do agree um, because I, I'm, I'm for, I'm for a value. It makes libertarians very uncomfortable when people agree with them. No, I'm. Um, it feels very cool. No, it's, one, it's one reason why it's like, you know, I, I feel like I, I'm, I'm here among um, people that I'm very, very aligned with, truthfully. Um, so I, I think a value added tax um, as an eventual replacement for an income tax makes a ton of sense. Um, because the, what you want more in society is more work and work-like arrangements, and why the heck would you be taxing what you're looking to find more of? Um, you know, it's like it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So, so, so the first big step in that direction is to throw down a value-added tax and say, look, we're transferring the dividend, and then start trying to move the economy in that direction. Real quick, so do we have Democratic candidate for president, Andrew Yang, saying he would eventually like to phase out the income tax? Because that would certainly <laughs> get a lot of applause here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I, I think uh, an income tax is a is is the poor way. It's an inefficient way to generate revenue, and I would favor moving towards a, a more efficient way. Very cool. It's one reason, guys. Like you know, really, I'm like like some people I know have an aversion towards like anyone with a D next to them. I get it, <laughs> um, but I, I'm really uh, not that kind of Democrat, shall we say? So, so Jeff, yep. A couple points. One, in Europe, that has almost entirely adopted value-added taxes. There's zero evidence that it's led to elimination of the income taxes. It's led to higher levels of taxation. Total, or, total at a minute, or maybe you could argue 
Europe was on a path where it wanted more spending, and so it was going to have more taxation of one form or another, mm -hmm. and the value-added tax didn't cause them to have higher spending, but it didn't prevent them from having higher spending, and it didn't get rid of the income tax. Sure, sure. Um, so what the, the discussion here is in some ways very similar to other discussions that have the same grand bargain flavor. Indeed, I think at this very moment there's a debate about climate policy. About carbon where, taxes. Carbon taxes. Glad you guys are here with us. This is better. <laughs> <laughs> but in some ways it's exactly the same <laughs> political economy question is lots of economists, even libertarian-leaning free market economists would say, look, if you got rid of all the costly command and control attempts to reduce carbon uh, emissions, Okay, you replace all of that with a budget neutral, a revenue neutral carbon tax, and so you're taxing something which we, many people think of as a bad, and reduce taxation on income, which we think of as a good thing, on taxation on savings, which is a good thing. We'd be making the tax system more efficient. We wouldn't be spending any more or less. Okay? If you believe that that would be the bargain and it would happen that way, then libertarians could basically go along with it, except as a matter of political economy, nobody believes that's the way it's going to happen. Everybody thinks that what will happen is what happened in Europe with the value-added tax. It was more tax revenue and more spending, not a substitution, not a just a change in the structure in the direction that makes economic sense. It's instead going to be adding a carbon tax to all the existing taxes and all the existing regulation. In the case of UBI, my forecast is it will be mainly on top of all the existing spending. And so it will have this huge negative effect on the budget. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to suggest uh, something that like, you guys probably get a sense of me from talking. Like, I'm an entrepreneur, and like, none of this stuff is abstract anymore. Like, our country is getting torn apart by the fact that technology is changing like, the labor arrangement for good. Like, all the presumptions we made about capitalism. I'm going to quote a friend of mine, Eric Weinstein, who said that we never knew that capitalism was going to get eaten by its son, technology, um, where all of the things we assume about the economic arrangements are breaking down. Like if a company becomes successful, does not need to hire lots of people, does not need to pay them well, does not need to treat them well, does not care what happens in its own backyard, like things are breaking down. Uh, and so I'm not here to argue about abstractions, like I'm gonna make this happen. Um, I've already raised hundreds of thousands of dollars from tens of thousands of donors around the country. I've been to Iowa seven times, I was in the recent CNN poll there, where 1% of Iowans now have me as one of their top uh, two choices for president because I'm talking sense. I go to them and say, guys, have you noticed stores closing where you live? They say yes. I say, why is that? They say Amazon. I say, that's right. Is that gonna get better or worse? They say, much, much worse. I say, also right. Um, and what are you gonna do about it? And they were like, we can't do anything about it. And I was like, no, you're wrong. If I become president, I will declare a dividend. You will get back some of that money that's flowing up to the cloud and you can rebuild your Main Street economies the way you want to here in Iowa. And they're getting behind that. So if you want this point of view, because I agree with uh, much of what Jeff is saying, is like, sure, we can argue in that room about like the grand bargain, how does it happen in real life? Like, it is time for new solutions. We have to go big. It's 2019, our government is hopelessly stuck in the past. If we just wait for it to modernize itself, it's never going to do so. Um, I'm a parent, I've got six and three-year-old boys, and I am petrified about the country that they're going to inherit. So if you want this point of view, on the Democratic debate stage in June, uh, go to yang2020.com and just give five bucks because <laughs> if we get enough supporters, I will make that debate stage 100% and I can talk sense to the other Democrats. So, this is, yeah, of course. Can we talk yeah. about the concern that increases, improvements in technology are going to lead to this state in which we have as few rich entrepreneurs and hundreds of millions you of people You beat me to it. That's going to be my question. Yeah. In sort of all they can do, qualified to do, is put stuff in the boxes that get sent to Amazon, but even that's going to get automated and they're not going to have those jobs at all. Is that possible? Well, yeah, at some level it's possible. Does anything in history say it's likely? I don't see it at all. People have been raising this concern, this Luddite concern that technology is bad, that machines are going to replace people for decades and decades, and it keeps not happening. So also remember, let's say we have all this wonderful technology, and it turns out that for seven cents, Amazon can deliver your groceries to your door for you. Okay? Then that's a really good thing for everybody of every income. And so the wage adjusted for the improvements 
in technology for the cost of living will in fact maybe be higher because this technology has done these phenomenal things to make everything really inexpensive for, for people broadly. So I just don't see why we're so concerned about that now because all the past predictions of it have not come, come out. So it it has been wrong I'm every time in the past, but there's a first time for everything. Sure. Uh, huh. You know, Donald Trump is the first Donald <laughs> Trump to become president. And, uh, and you know, and, and we all know here in this room, if you just want to say like, hey, um, you know, it's going to be fine, like artificial intelligence is just like the steam engine, um, then, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't think anyone here holds that opinion. I mean, where artificial intelligence is going to be the new electricity, and we need to wake up, we need to modernize, and we need to start reorganizing this economy around ourselves as fast as humanly possible. So I think rather than a disagreement between that forecast um, of, of automation and, and AI, where does the freedom dividend stand if you're wrong on that assumption? And I'm not saying you're necessarily wrong on that assumption, but that has to be something we, that we obviously also discuss. Is the freedom dividend only a worthwhile policy, or is UBI only a worthwhile policy in that more pessimistic view of AI and tech, or is it applicable in what Jeff is describing is the regular cycle of technological advancement? You know, I'm a huge fan of the positive effects on the individual and the family and the community, where if you look at it, uh, children's health improves, their, their personalities change, become more conscientious and agreeable. Uh, mental health improves, domestic violence goes down, like all the things you would want to happen in a healthy society are more possible if people have, you know, like a, a bit of extra money. So those things would occur regardless of uh, whether or not automation is indeed going to transform our economy in various ways. But I'm going to submit that, like, to me there is no doubt that, like, this time is different. Um, and you, you don't need to look far, you can look at the numbers. Like right now as we're here together, our labor force participation rate is 63%, the same level as El Salvador and the Dominican Republic in year 10 of an expansion. And one in five prime working age American men between the ages of 21 and 30 has not worked in the last 12 months. That's right now. Uh, and so you don't need to look very far. Like eight Americans are dying of drugs every hour right now. Uh, our life expectancy has declined for the last three years. The first time since the great flu pandemic of 1918, which I had to look up, um, it's that far back. Like, all of this stuff is right now. This is no longer speculative. This is no longer, oh, like, we'll know it when we see it. We're living it. We're in the middle of it. We're in the third inning, and our, our politicians, for whatever reason, can't even acknowledge the elephant in the room that's changing uh, our communities and our lives for good. Do you want or to, for bad. Do you want to respond Ill. on that argument? And then we'll move into our last section. Uh, very briefly. Yeah. Uh, tons of things are different that are affecting labor force participation and things like that. Wages are stagnating, but more and more people have subsidized health insurance, either via their employer or via Obamacare and so on and so forth. Disability insurance is a much more expansive program than it was 40 years ago. So many people maybe are earning more wages or no wages and not in the labor force, but okay, they are not out on the street. They're not. And, and they, you and I they, both they, hate they, disability. So like, arguing that disability is like helping people is like neither of us would be for that. There is a ton more regulation on entering professions, occupational licensing and restrictions and so on. That has something to do with why we're seeing people having a harder time. So I. Maybe there's some things which point to things are, are more difficult than they used to be for a less skilled worker, but I would want to look to all the things that government is doing which get in the way of those people before I jump to the conclusion that the, technology, the effects of technology are going to be different. So basically, pull back the state before we can actually see if that forecast is accurate. Stop, for, before we do something new, undo the bad things that we're already doing, which mm -hmm. will go in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think we need to do both. Okay, so this has been great. You guys have both touched on a, a, a couple really important issues. and We've gotten a little bit in the weeds on the, on the policy wonk side, which I know our audience really appreciates. What I want to do in this last five minutes or so is give you each the opportunity to directly ask each other any specific questions you have remaining preferably shorter questions, any gaps that you think we've missed, so that our audience can kind of take away the complete package before we close up in five minutes. Um, I, I feel very clear on Jeff's thinking and appreciate it a great deal. 
Do you have any specifics you would like to? None on the UBI, no. I would, if we're going a little broader, sure. I would raise the issue that Andrew discussed, that he also has all these concerns about the healthcare system and the fact that it's getting more and more expensive. What, how would you go about fixing it? Uh, so I think our healthcare system has the wrong incentives, where everyone has an incentive to generate activity and uh, billables, and, and it may or may not be right for the patient. People just don't want to get sued. Um, so you have to try and align their incentives and reduce like the litigiousness and uh, a lot of other things that um, are like distorting doctor and uh, provider behavior. So a libertarian would, like me would say there's a pretty simple way to do that that also is beneficial for the budget, which is, for example, to make the copays and deductibles under Medicare in particular, but maybe even to some degree Medicaid, you know, Obama, way bigger, okay, so that almost everybody who's not very poor should expect that they're going to pay, pay $10,000 out of pocket per year, okay, not, say, 2000 which would be sort of typical uh, these days. And then they will not take up medical care that they don't really think is worthwhile, and that will put reduced pressure on healthcare price inflation, all that sort I, of thing. I, I, I understand the yeah. uh, economics there, and I agree that having some skin in the game for the individual like would, would push better behavior. And I'd I, just like to throw out, we have a few minutes, like, because I have to actually run after this. Does anyone want to throw out a question from the audience? Because I know that, like, uh, I'm, I'm doing it in the next room, but I know I, I just have this crazy schedule. Sure, real quick, the gentleman in the front. So the so the question for people who can't hear um, is does a you know does a does a freedom dividend or any ca cash transfer truly translate into spending or do people save what is their propensity to save does it change the discussion? Yeah. So in a country where forty percent of Americans can't afford an unexpected four hundred dollar bill, for better or for worse, most of it's going to get spent, <laughs> like most people. Um, and then if they do save it for their children's education, the rest of it, I would say that's probably a win. Um, that that helps establish like a future orientation uh, for for more and more people. And you do see that in in um, some of the context. I Jeff. completely agree. Bush and the other stimulus things are one offs. It doesn't have much effect on your total wealth, so you shouldn't be spending very much more <laughs> of it. Yeah. Okay, this is a permanent change in people's well being. Most of it's going to get spent. So we'll do one more question from the floor. What we're actually going to do for a more um, kind of intimate Q&A is across the hall in the continuing the conversation room. Both speakers will go there. I know that you have to leave for a flight relatively quickly, but Jeff, if your you... flight's been canceled. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's what I'm worried about. That's yeah. what I'm going to go to the airport and freaking... My but, I mean, uh, but Jeff, no. if, if you wouldn't mind... Where's my uh, staff? Jo yeah, yeah, joining us in the continuing sure. the conversation room for some additional <laughs> Q&A. Um, so we'll go one last question. Uh, the gentleman in the black shirt. I, uh, I have one quick unrelated side comment in that sure. uh, I think I speak for everybody here that uh, I, I would encourage you to please join Tulsi Gabbard as a, as a voice, you, to use your platform as a voice for foreign policy sanity because God knows the world could use more anti-war voices. But my, my question is, uh, if, if this is a good idea, why can't it be done on a small scale in say one state or one city voluntarily without using the force of government by all the CEOs that would agree with you. And just please do keep it brief. Oh, no, very, very snappy, sure. Um, the, the problem is that like any state seconds. or city yeah, that adopted this then would induce people to move across state or city lines like into that locality if it were significant at all. And 40 out of 50 states have a balanced budget amendment, which would um, you know, like also curtail like a, a consistent commitment. Um, that's one reason why Alaska is ideal because it's geographically remote and had this petroleum money. Um, so in, in my mind, you, we need to, to make this a federal initiative. That's a great question. There are pilots, but the pilots are, are quite small. And Jeff, you wanted to weigh in. So I would use that as an excuse to go back to my first point. Should the federal government be redistributing at all? Set that aside for the moment and just ask what would happen if it stopped doing it? Many people, okay, especially on the left, but broadly would think there would just start off thinking there will be no redistribution, there will be no social safety net at all. That's not the case. States will, in fact, have their own social safety nets. 
many people say in response, oh, but there will be a race to the bottom. Every state will be worried exactly about what Andrew said about attracting, being a welfare magnet, attracting people across state lines. But states will address that by having residency requirements. And if it's state by state, and states have to worry about being overly generous, because if they are, they might attract too many people, that will help balance the tendency for welfare spending to grow faster than to me seems appropriate. So I think a state by state approach, maybe not something all libertarians would vote for, but far better, and there, it, it will exist unless federal policy outlaws it, which it shouldn't, and so there will be some social safety net. So I wanna first off um, thank both of you for attending. Jeff, you've always been uh, a very great supporter of Students for Liberty and, and attending our events and speaking at our events and, and providing assistance for our students. That is My incredibly appreciated. Andrew, you're new to the SFL family, and I certainly do consider you as part of the SFL family. You're definitely welcome back at, at, at our events. We, we, part of our brand is encouraging discussions like this and, and hashing out those ideas in a cordial manner, which is above the, the political discourse of the day. And I think you both have represented that and, and, and done that ideal justice. Um, on that healthcare topic, I think we should now solidify that you guys will come back in 2020 and, <laughs> and discuss healthcare. But uh, thank you both. If you all would join me in giving our speakers a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jeff, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. It was really thank great. You. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you.